This time on Pedalbox, we finally deliver on a promise that we made to you guys nearly three years ago. We're finally going through the Racing Aspiration suspension design tools. That's right folks, all the way back in episode 9 we used Racing Aspiration's design tools to help build the rear suspension on our track car and today we're going to revisit it. It's kind of relevant to us right now because we're about to do a minor redesign on some of our front suspension and it's about time for us to blow the cobwebs off it again and we figure while we're at it we may as well run you guys through how it works. So we're here at the Racing Aspirations homepage where you can see they've got a whole bunch of different calculators. The two that we care most about here are the Suspension Geometry Calculator and the McPherson Calculator. Now the McPherson Calculator is not so relevant to us because it's designed to deal with McPherson suspension as the name suggests, which is the kind of suspension system that we had on the front end of the A3 before we took it all apart and converted it to double wishbone. Double wishbone is a type of suspension that you find on a lot of kit cars and a lot of sports cars. Even most supercars use some variant of double wishbone suspension, although the implementations tend to be a little bit cleverer. The basic idea is you've got two suspension arms, usually of unequal length, a longer one on the bottom and a shorter one on the top. And on one end, they're attached to the chassis, and on the other end, they're attached to the top and bottom of your wheel hub. And as the wheel moves up and down, the two suspension arms both move in parallel or in parallel-ish, allowing motion of the wheel. Now the trick to double wishbone suspension design is figuring out where your attachment points fit because that determines the length of the arms and also a lot of the geometry behaviour. If you've got a longer bottom arm on your suspension and a shorter top arm, you can imagine as the wheel moves up, the upper arm pulls in a lot more than the end of the bottom arm. The bottom arm kind of does this and doesn't really move in very much. The upper arm sort of pulls in a lot more aggressively and that buys you a lot of negative camber and it pulls the tops of the tyres in as the suspension compresses, which is usually the kind of behaviour that you want on a track. Now the tricky part in building a double wishbone suspension system is in trying to get the right amount of camber and other behaviours as the wheel travels. If you've ever seen a Formula 1 car you'll notice that the suspension is attached quite close to the middle of the car and the arms are really long and the basic reason for that is kind of similar to the panhard bar on the rear axle of an American muscle car. The longer the arm is, the less horizontal motion you get of the wheel as it lifts up through compression. So if you've got a really really long arm like this and the wheel comes up, you can, you can see it's not really coming in very much. Whereas if you've got a very short suspension arm, to get much vertical travel it has to move in a lot further around that arc. And by setting the attachment points of the arms differently on the chassis and the hubs and setting the arms at different lengths to each other relatively, you can change how much camber you pick up by having the, the top arm shorter and pulls the top of the wheel in more as the wheel compresses. Now a really good engineer can design this stuff on paper and do the maths in their head, but we're not really good engineers and there's a good chance that even if you are one, you can't be bothered doing it manually. We've invented computers for a reason, after all. So this is how we're going to do it in Racing Aspirations. Now when you drop into the suspension design tools on Racing Aspirations, there's a few different types of data entry you've got. There are two that you'll probably have if you're an OEM and you're actually properly designing a suspension system. And there's also one that's a lot more useful for manual data entry like what we have on our car and probably like what you have on yours where you just go piece by piece and you measure offsets and lengths and angles of various different components. So that's what we're going to use. Now some of the measurements in here are nice and simple to understand and a few of them not so much. The easy ones are the upper and lower control arm length and bearing, which are the first four pieces of data that you'll enter. The length measurement is exactly what you'd expect it to be. It's the centre to centre distance of the two pivot points of the arm. And the bearing is just how many degrees off of level it is. The only thing you've got to pay attention to with the bearings is that when they're negative numbers, the arm is up at the outside. So if your chassis is quite high and your arms hang down a bit toward the wheel, you'll have positive numbers. If the arms reach up to the wheel, they'll be negative. So once you've punched in the lengths and angles of your control arms, you can look at the wheel end of both arms and look at the two pivot Pivot points. Now if you draw a line from one pivot point to the other we can call that your virtual kingpin. Once upon a long time ago cars had an actual kingpin that the steering assembly would fit onto and your, t your wheel would like steer around this pin and it would slide up and down on it for your suspension travel. Obviously we don't have those anymore but from a mechanics point of view like from how the suspension moves we have a virtual one and this describes how a lot of your uh, steering geometry behaves. Now this virtual kingpin line is actually quite important because we use that to measure the next two pieces of data that we're entering. Now next up we're going to go through what Racing Aspirations calls the upright measurements and we're going to enter the second one first just because it's a little bit easier to understand and get our heads around. Now if you imagine drawing a line through the centre of your wheel along its like axis of rotation, if it had an axle it would be along that line, you draw that line all the way out and wherever it intersects with your virtual kingpin um, you take that line and the length of it is the measurement we're after here. Now if we look at the kingpin end of that line that we just traced out to the hub and trace it up instead to the joint on the upper control arm, that's your kingpin to spindle offset. 
Upright. 20th time's a charm. Now those two upright measurements are probably the most complicated part of this whole thing to get your head around. Everything else is nice, simple measurements. The chassis ones especially are really easy. All you need to measure for this one is the width, the distance between the two upper control arm links on the chassis and the distance between the two lower control arm links on the chassis, and then how far apart they are vertically. So you might have something like 800 mil apart and 700 mil apart and 300 or 400 mil of vertical spacing, for example. Now next up we've got a really really easy one for you, you need your tyre dimensions and this is your tyre width, aspect ratio and rim diameter and you can read these directly off the side of your tyre. One second. Well as it happens we've actually got the remnants of a tyre with all the measurements that we care about stamped on it up in our set here. So this is a 205 55 16 or the remains of one. This fell off of a BMW 3 Series Compact that had a blowout on the motorway, but that's another story. Next up, you'll need to know your offset, which is usually stamped on the inside of your wheel. If it isn't, you've probably got a bit of a harder time, but you can probably find your offset on some forum or blog post or something somewhere. And after that, the only thing that you need is your camber. Now, measuring camber accurately can be quite tricky. You can either go to a shop and get it aligned, but that costs a fair bit of money, or you can cheat. Finding the offset of your wheel should be nice and easy. Most of the time it'll be part of the casting or manufacturing in the back here. So we've got a nice little ET35 written on the inside. Now normally you'll see it stamped with an ET prefix, which is how you know it's measuring your offset, not your backspacing. Offset and backspacing kind of measure the same thing, but they use a different process. Backspacing is how far is it from this face to the inside of the wheel, while offset is how far is it from that, from that face to the center line of the wheels. So they do measure different things. Now, if your wheel doesn't have that written in, you can measure it fairly easily. It involves a tiny, tiny amount of maths. What you need to do, just measure up the whole width of your wheel and tire. Doesn't matter whether you measure the wheel or the tire, it's actually the same either way. And then you measure down from this all the way to that face. And let's say your wheel and tire is 300 millimeters wide and the distance that you measure down to that face is 200 millimeters. You subtract one from the other, so you've got 100 mil, and then you have it, and that gives you 50 mil, and that's your offset. If it goes negative, because the hub is all the way up here, you'll obviously have negative 50 or negative whatever, and then you know you have a negative offset. You can usually kind of eyeball it, you'll know if you've got positive or negative, so you've just got to get the right number. So once you've got a level off of your car, so you know that everything's zeroed out to the chassis properly, you can take your level, pop it on something that you trust to be flat and straight, and you put that down the edge of your alloy wheel. And hopefully, because we're targeting sort of two or three degrees of negative camber, we're expecting five, 10, 15, 20, all the way around 87 or so degrees to show up on our gauge. And right now it actually says 89.4, which means we're 0.6 degrees of negative camber. And with all of that entered, we're finally ready to start playing around with the model of your car. So you can hit apply at the bottom and then it takes you to a fully built model ready to simulate. Now from here you can drag the chassis up and down to simulate going over, over crests and squashing down in compression. That'll show you how the suspension loads up and cambers under compression. And you can also roll it left and right to simulate the rolling forces that you get during cornering. And again, it simulates your contact patches and camber behavior through all of that. And that, believe it or not, is all the information that you need to build a model of your car. So feel free to have a play around with the simulator there and see how everything works. Next time we're going to do a complete run through of going out to our track car, taking a bunch of measurements off of that and building a real model of it in the simulator here and trying to figure out how good or bad of a job we've done on its suspension. So make sure you're subscribed and ring the bell so you don't miss that one when it comes out. If you fancy any of our snazzy new merch, you can check out shop.pedalbox.show where you've got t-shirts, beanie hats that I'm not wearing for once and all sorts of other goodies. You can also jump on patreon.com forward slash pedalboxshow and support us there for as little as a dollar a month. All the higher tiers give you warm and fuzzies, but everything from a dollar up gets you access to our Discord server where you can ask us questions in real-time chat. We often talk like random nonsense on there, which is good fun as well. And we really, really appreciate every pound we get through that. It really does help us. And we are using all that money, mostly at the minute on the track car. I think it's bought us an exhaust and a few other bits and pieces that we still haven't shown you, but I promise we'll get to them sooner or later. Thanks very much for watching. We'll see you next time.